Good evening. Welcome to Columbia Heights Public Schools Independent School District 13 School Board meeting for Tuesday, April 11, 2017. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, and welcome again. And uh, Natty, if you would please call the roll. Larkin? Here. Palmer? Here. Mueller? Here. A Samurai? Here. Severson? Here. Lewis? Here. Superintendent Kelly? Here. Thank you. Our mission statement, Columbia Heights Public Schools create worlds of opportunity for every learner in partnership with supportive small town communities by challenging all to discover their talents, unleash their potential, and develop tools for lifelong success. Our core values are community, excellence, collaboration, integrity, respect, courage, and innovation. Next up, uh, agenda approval adjustments, announcements, and correspondence. First up would be an approval of the agenda. If I get a motion to move that forward, please. So moved. Laura? Second. Molly, thank you. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, motion carries. Announcements, April 14th, Friday, no school, the district office is closed. April 18th, Tuesday at 5 p.m., there'll be a school board listening session here in the Family Center. Uh, April 18th at 5.30, it'll be a school board work session. April 25th, Tuesday at 7 p.m., be a regular school board meeting. Uh, next up, correspondence. Superintendent Kelly, is there any correspondence this evening? Mr. Chair and members, there's no correspondence this evening. Thank you. Uh, next up would be communication to the board. Uh -huh. Citizen and employee representatives. At this time, any citizen or employee may briefly address the school board. The board will listen to the brief remarks, ask clarifying questions, and if desired, request that administration follow up. The board will not take action at this meeting on requests presented at this time. Is there anyone here to speak tonight? Okay. Seeing no one, we will move on. Uh, next up is the consent agenda, which includes the minutes of the March 21st school board meeting the personnel report and the treasurer's report for February of 2017. I get a motion to move that forward. So moved. Lorian? Second. Natty, thank you. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Next up is discussion reports and information items. Reports from members of the board. Board members will report on board activities since the last regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. <coughs> Lorian, are you okay going first? Sure. Thank Sooner you. or later, though, we'll have to start on that side of the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? Remind me next meeting, we'll start with Holla. Be prepared, Holla. Yeah. Um, since the last meeting, um, I had the pleasure of attending two of the um, boys' basketball sectional games. Um, that was a really exciting time. And um, I'd like to give a shout out to Mr. Palmer and the pet band, um, I think they did an excellent job. Um, I may be a little bit partial, but I think they did an excellent job um, keeping up our momentum during that game, those games as well. Um, I also attended um, the Highland Elementary Girls Night, and I helped facilitate that program. Um, we had over 50 girls attending from um, all three of the elementary schools, and it was really a, a great night for the girls. Um, I also attended the Citizens for Safer Streets uh, community meeting um, that took place. Um, and I thought that there were some really good discussion items at, at that meeting. Um, and then just prior to this meeting, I was at the Columbia Academy fifth grade um, family open house. And I thought that that was a really great way to introduce the families to the curriculum and um, kind of get us ready for middle school. Um, and then with that too, the web leaders did an excellent job. They were really doing a great job welcoming families in and bringing them around uh, on the tour. So it was great. Cool. Thank you. Laura? Uh, yes, um, I've had a couple of meetings. Uh, I went to um, 916, that's the monthly board meeting. 916 is, um, for anybody who doesn't know, it is a collaboration of school districts um, where we collaborate together with a, 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 a superintendent is also there to, to um, uh, help us with our collaboration. But um, we work with uh, special education programming and um, how to, especially as a smaller district, um, we're able to better serve our students that have special needs. 
and then there's um, um, uh, different types of educational opportunities and opportunities to work with other districts on other programming. So that's always pretty awesome. Uh, one of the um, we did get an update on um, the the buildings. Uh, right now, we're in the process of uh, half of Lake Elmo, uh, that Lake Elmo facility, um, Pancalo is. Um, is nearly done. We've had a lot of rain, so that's kind of half the building is done, and the other half is still kind of just beams and stuff. Um, but that is on schedule, so we're excited to see that. That's going to be um, very similar in nature to the um, into Carner Blue. So um, I, I look forward to whenever that's available. If uh, anybody would like to attend. Um, any of the board members would like to attend and get a tour of that facility. I think that's great. There is also going to be a tour of the South Campus and Bel Air educational programs at 9 a.m. to 11.15 on Wednesday the 19th. And if anybody is interested in, um, in uh, participating in that, you would actually have to uh, contact, um, uh, probably Dawn can put you in touch with uh, um, the, uh, we have to, you have to, um, uh, send out a confirmation that you'll be attending so that they know how many people that they're going to be giving a tour to. Um, we also had um, an, uh, um, a discussion on a social media policy, which they're going to be, uh, it's gonna be a brand new policy um, that they're gonna have over at uh, 916. We don't presently have a social media policy in this district, um, but uh, they did answer a lot of the questions that I had had with regards to um, the, the district's uh, responsibility if um, if we were to undertake that kind of a policy so I, th I thought it was kind of interesting and I'd like to actually present it maybe for your review maybe you might be interested in doing something like that um, I also attended the AMSD meeting and we got kind of a legislative update um, probably some highlights from that is um, is that they are looking at increasing the employer contribution uh, to the retirement, the TRA retirement fund, um, to 2% for the employer, um, because we're probably just a little bit underfunded. We're a lot more solid than maybe a lot of other uh, types of uh, government um, retirement accounts. Um, so it's still pretty solid, but looking into the future, they think that they kind of overestimated um, how much the returns were gonna be. So that may be coming down to the district, um, or there might possibly be a one-time contra uh, contribution uh, that the state would put in to offset things. Um, so anyway, there is gonna be a change in formula more than likely in the special ed, um, but that's gonna be offset by some other things as well because uh, cross-subsidy does not seem to be on anybody's radar. Sorry to say that. Um, the other thing that's um, kind of interesting too is um, this looks like it's moving through both uh, the House and the Senate on limiting um, the uh, election dates um, that you can actually um, hold an election um, to uh, four or five dates depending upon whether you're looking at the House bill or the Senate bill and uh, moving the primary up. So that's something and changing the language requirements for questions. Um, so I guess it's a, apparently you need to go into extreme detail now um, if you want to propose a question on the ballot. And the other thing too is uh, requiring the counties to administer the elections. And then, um, so if we had an election, we, the, uh, the county of Anoka County would have to administer the election and then they would send us the bill. So that's all interesting. If anybody has any further questions, um, there is um, a bill tracker on the AMSD um, website and some other information. And I think that'll do it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Only. Yeah, it might not be much quicker. Um, <laughs> but thanks for doing that. Yes, right. thank you. I was thank trying you. to really shorten it up a lot, but there was a yes. lot there. Yep. So. Wonderful information, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I just um, was not that busy. Um, I did um, have the opportunity to watch our varsity basketball team participate in the state tournament um, with many, many fans and um, staff and administration and students and pep band and um, the entire experience I think was just really, it was phenomenal. It was great to see our students represent themselves as well as they did. Um, and congratulations to the team on fourth place at state. That was wonderful. Um, I also attended a track meet, their first one of the season going on right now at the high school and um, had a lot of conversations with um, parents and community members. And that's it. Yeah, thank you. Ma'am. 
Yeah, I also got to see the boys basketball team play in the state tournament, and that was a blast for, for me um, and for the kids. It was so fun to see them, so excited, and so many of them. I mean, it was impressive. I, was, I felt really well represented and really proud of the kids and the staff who brought them on whatever, 13 busloads of students. That was a logistical difficulty, but they pulled it off and smiled the whole time. So kudos to the to the, everyone who worked on that. Um, I got to attend uh, the National School Board Association Conference in Denver, and I think in a couple weeks, um, Hall and I will have the pleasure of telling you a little bit more about what we learned. Um, but it was, a, it was a learning experience. Uh, maybe not everything I expected, but I, I learned a lot. Um, I was just at the sub, uh, subcommittee meeting on policy. I've also been able to attend a couple of softball games. Uh, the spring sports outside are starting, just like track. That's very exciting. Um, and then had many conversations with other board members, uh, members of the community, and brief conversations even with Superintendent Kelly. So. Thank you. Paula. Um, I attended Is this that one? Mm -mm. Okay, I attended NSBA, National School Board Association, conference with Natty in Denver. Um, it was good, and we'll be sharing our insights in the work session. And also, I was at the policy subcommittee meeting, going over some of the policies, and not much else. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I also, I got to see the, the final game in the basketball tournament and uh, also very proud of the kids, both on the court and in the stands. Um, it was really nice to see, fun to see. Um, I attended Valley View, had their carnival, if I got the name wrong, sorry. And then uh, North Park had their fine arts festival evening, got to attend both of those. Seemed to be both really well attended by parents and stuff, so a lot of fun. Um, the Safer Streets meeting I was also at uh, with Lorian, attended the policy meeting prior to this and then a chair meeting prior to that. So, and that concludes my report. So next up would be the superintendent's report. Um, Mr. Chair and members, the Columbia Heights uh, Public School District uh, uh, 2017 Teacher of the Year uh, is Erin Edwardson Stern, and we'll be celebrating her tomorrow night. It's open to the public. Uh, the festivities begin at 4 o'clock in this very room, so if you're available, please come over and congr congratulate Erin Edwardson Stern. She will also, the other nominees will be there as well. Um, I loved, loved, loved the basketball tournament, and I, I, I also wanted to congratulate um, guard Wendell Matthews, who was selected to be the 2017 um, class uh, uh, AAA Minnesota State Boys Basketball All-Tournament team. Yeah. Um, that was a big honor. Uh, and then <clears throat> from March 25th through April 1st, it was my extreme pleasure <laughs> um, to be a chaperone on the Columbia Heights High School New York City Study Seminar. Uh, 38 students plus the chaperones were really immersed in a whirlwind of studying and, and activities. And it was really see, do, learn um, to the extreme. The experience involved everything from doing college visits, as, as some of you already know, um, to um, visiting multiple art museums. Um, they did Broadway and cho choral performances. Uh, they visited the 9-11 Museum. Miss um, Scully and um, Mr. Hodges had them up at 5.30 in the morning doing photography throughout the city of New York. Uh, <clears throat> they did two Broadway shows, Phantom of the Opera and Paramore. And uh, they were two different kinds of Broadway shows, but they got an opportunity to meet the cast of each afterwards and then did some backstage uh, touring. And then um, uh, I think when we, the best part of the trip for me was really watching them grow. And then um, on the bus coming and going in the 25 hours it took us <laughs> one way and the other, I learned a lot about technology. So I, I learned more about my Instagram account <laughs> because the kids made it a whole lot easier for me to navigate. So I want to say special thanks though to all the parents and the sponsors and the board. Um, who approved the trip, who really made it possible for um, the kids to go. 
and um, I think that we're going to bring them back and have them talk a little bit with you. And of course, in two years, another group will be going. So we want to make sure that you know what we accomplished this year. But it was really a special time, I think, for the kids and for the chaperones. And I'm sure the parents were happy to get them back. Um, but I still miss them a little. I'm <laughs> used to being around them. Um, I want to make a put a plug in for the Columbia Heights High School musical that it will be coming up. They're doing a little shop of horrors. And that'll be April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, and April 27th, 28th, and 29th. All of the performances are at 7 o'clock p.m. They've been practicing very, very hard. You can see them coming in with their props and, <clears throat> and working, and I'm sure they would appreciate an audience. So anybody that wants to come out, please do. Um, I attended the um, <clears throat> chair meeting before this and the subcommittee on school board policy, and I've had communications with multiple members um, So I want, of the school board, so I want to thank you for meeting or chatting or texting with me. Thank you very much. Okay, um, on the play, the 22nd, is that that Sunday? Is that a matinee show or is that one at seven also? What I'm hearing, because it's on the calendar and I checked this with okay. um, Casey, is that they're all at seven. Okay, cool, all right. Mm -hmm. That's normally has been a matinee. Mm -hmm. I know it has so. been and it's just, um, it was kind of unusual and I checked with Casey, I said, are we sure? Because we put it out on Instagram and we've got it on Facebook and stuff like that, but that's what we were told by the director and the high school principal, right. so Very good. there you are. That's good to know as a parent of someone in the play. Um, <laughs> the one thing I forgot to mention, you guys laugh, you guys can relate, I'm sure. Uh, one thing that I meant to mention in my report is uh, tomorrow evening at uh, Immersion Hall, there's going to be a, a fundraiser. It's a benefit for Alice Lentz, uh, one of our parents in the community that uh, recently uh, had a significant medical um, event that took place, and they're doing a fundraiser tomorrow evening from 5 to 8 at Immersion Hall. Um, it's five dollars for students, eight dollars for adults. Uh, there'll be silent auction items, food and beverages as well. So, um, if you're able to attend, I'm sure that it would be greatly appreciated. So, and if I might add to that, the choir is going to um, uh, uh, perform at six o'clock, I think. So, another chance to hear them as well. Yep. Thank you. Okay. We shall move forward. Next up would be um, item C, which is our community education video. And we got <clears throat> Casey and Kristen. Chair Larkin, members of the school board, Superintendent Kelly, good evening. Tonight we are introducing the fifth of our six new informational videos. And, and I talked to the videographer during the editing process, and he said this was by far the most challenging in a positive manner, <laughs> in a positive manner, because the program offers so much. His challenge was to capture all this great information and package the story into two and a half minutes. I believe he met, actually I believe he exceeded the challenge of telling the community education story. As with all of our videos, the stories they tell are aligned to our district mission, core values, strategic roadmap, and comprehensive communications plan. Tonight, in all of our videos, are strategies that help us achieve strategic direction E of Tell Our Story. And so we're going to start out, and then I'm going to turn it over to... Life is about learning. There isn't, it should never stop. We really believe in that lifelong learning, and that, I think, is kind of what community ed is all about. Good job, high five! From early childhood, through adulthood. Community education programs are not only about education, but they're about community building. Early Childhood is a program that focuses on the whole child and the family from birth through five. We have curriculum planned around their developmental milestones. It's a really good chance for children to come practice social skills. There are classes that are ages birth through five, toddler only or infant only. Early childhood family education is great for parents to form a community and engage with other parents. Adventure Club is for our school-age children, kindergarten through fifth grade. We have a guided group time. We do science experiments. We have a homework and reading time. A lot of enrichment activities. We also do enrichment programs after school. And that's for targeted services. And sometimes we partner with community organizations such as the library or the Northern Clay Center. Adult enrichment is the program that probably most people associate with community education. It's a wonderful opportunity. I mean, you can learn anything that you'd like to learn. Classes in cooking, in dance, in art, in fitness, in 
in so many different areas, adults who want to learn a new skill, a new hobby. Life is learning, and when life stops becoming learning, then I think a large portion of life stops. We want to match these two together. Here at the Adult Ed Center, we serve about a thousand learners a year. We offer English classes, and then we also have students who are preparing to take the GED exam. It's wonderful to see those adults taking on that challenge of learning another language or another skill. It's making a difference in people's individual lives, in their confidence, in their success, and then that has a great impact on their families as well. I recommend to always explore your community education programming. It's a gift that the communities offer. I would invite anybody and everybody to engage with community education to help them in their learning, in their growth, in their community building. They too can be a Highlander with Columbia Heights Public Schools. And with that, the best person to tell a community education story is Director Kristen Stunkel. Well, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it's nice to have many people tell the story of community education. We're very grateful for Director Mahan and his department in helping us to be able to put together this video. We had about um, four hours one day and four hours an, on another day in order to do all of the taping. And I think that, I hope that you feel that the video really reflects the full spectrum of what we're able to provide to the community um, for lifelong learning. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I just wanted to say I thought that video was great, um, and that actually really moved me. Yeah. <laughs> so very, very well done. I have to add that um, in terms of being moved, that we kept having to retape when Kathleen Moriarty, the coordinator of the ABE program, was speaking because she and I kept crying <laughs> because we are really actually very moved. That's what choked me up. Yes. <laughs> I like the Highlander comment at the end. I do too. Yeah, yeah. it was great. It's very inclusive. Mm -hmm. Nice job. Thank Love you it. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, Blooming Heights Edible Schoolyard Outdoor Classroom Update. Chair Larkin, members of the school board, Superintendent Kelly, I'm pleased that we are here today, uh, first of all, to introduce to you Maya Lemon, who is our agriculture specialist, and she will be um, co-presenting with me. So let's get this up. So Blooming Heights Edible Schoolyard and Outdoor Classroom, you've been presented um, for many years now, over seven years annually, a presentation about the great work and learning that's happening out behind this building in Blooming Heights, creating worlds of opportunity for every learner. And in this presentation, which is really informational for you, there aren't any governance questions with our presentation this evening. We're really focusing on the core values of community, collaboration, and respect. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our agriculture specialist. Thank you all so much for making time to hear from us tonight. Um, I really love talking to people about Blooming Heights because I think that it's a space that really connects a lot of the different things, all of the different things that we're trying to do here as a school. And so this picture, this graphic right here sort of shows the ways that uh, a garden can be used to touch on all of the kind of aspects of curriculum that we're working on with our students. Um, and I think that we're doing some really good things to make that happen. Sort of just to share some highlights of the 2016-2017 school year with you all. We've had over 5,000 students in the garden um, in this school year so far. Uh, and many lessons taught, uh, both in classrooms as well as um, in the garden. Over 250 teachers have brought classes to the garden or had classroom visits. And this represents all grades, um, as well as early childhood and family um, parent education classes and many subjects in the school, science, art, life skills, AVID, EL, um, and others. One really exciting thing that we have worked on this year is a connection with the American Indian curriculum that's happening in all of the K-5 classes. So I worked with um, Native educators in the community as well as our teaching and learning department to develop curriculum that mirrored things that um, they were working on in classes. So this was sort of building a new, a new branch of the um, Native American curriculum that they're doing. So all K-5 classes had the chance to taste Minnesota wild rice, um, as well as having a lesson that uh, connected the natural world to the things that they were working on um, in terms of Native American education. 
Uh, another very exciting thing that we've been working on this year, we actually worked on this today, was our youth teaching youth collaboration. This is with uh, Minnesota 4-H and SNAP Ed, as well as the University of Minnesota. We have 12 high school students who applied and were selected to participate in this program. They um, went through a six day uh, training program over the course of a couple months where they were trained in nutrition education, that's SNAP-Ed um, curriculum. And then they are delivering that curriculum to Adventure Club students, so second through fifth grade students over the course of this spring. They also had the chance to go to an ag career day at the University of Minnesota where they learned about um, potential careers in agriculture as well as just getting to you know, walk around the campus and, and talk to uh, students at the campus which was a highlight. Many of them sort of, uh, we left that day and they were like, oh, I could see myself in college now, which was always an exciting thing to hear our students say. Uh, other things that we have going on last summer, um, I worked with Adventure Club all throughout the summer doing cooking as well as a garden stand that's every Wednesday from 4.30 or 4 to 5.30. Um, so we'd love to have you all come out. Uh, we also do a lot of harvesting. We do outdoor reading in the garden. I worked with the rec department to do biweekly programming with their little ones. Um, and this summer, um, I'm developing pollinator curriculum, to, which will sort of be the big overarching theme of the curriculum that Adventure Club, as well as um, summer school students, receive when they're in the garden. Some other highlights, um, I've done curricular connections with pre-K at Highland, so working with teachers there to develop lessons that, you know, one month they're working on measuring, and so we brought, uh, I brought earthworms into the classroom, and we measured earthworms, and then have them measure how tall they were in the length of an earthworm. <laughs> um, doing, I've done some project-based learning with Valley View fifth graders. Um, there's a group of fifth graders who have done a lot of research on um, different kinds of plants and are gonna be going, growing transplants to take home with them. Bi-weekly programming with fifth grade classes at North Park, so every two weeks I see um, the, every fifth grade class at North Park um, and have done different things to maintain their garden and also just sort of uh, develop them as gardeners and they have become really leaders in, in that space. They're able to walk out there and see what needs to be done and uh, initiate the work plan. Also have done uh, visits with high school EL classes, so using that space as a space for students to practice vocabulary and um, things like that by doing and tasting and really being immersed in an environment. Seed starting with high school special ed students um, as well as the Columbia Academy seventh grade honors class is doing uh, their science projects on seed starting. Um, so some of the plants will come up here to Blooming Heights. Some of them hopefully, hopefully most of them will survive but they're doing tests on them so I expect some of their plants <laughs> will probably not survive. <laughs> And sort of our upcoming um, focus, I'm looking to continue curricular connections, so continuing to work with teaching and learning as well as our teaching staff to fully integrate Blooming Heights into um, classrooms and then also outside of classroom experiences our students have. I'm working to create an outdoor classroom calendar and supplies so that teachers feel that they can come and use that, the garden space without me. It's, a, it's an outdoor classroom space that is dynamic whether I'm there or not. And um, so also bringing some supplies out there so that it's an easy place for teachers to come and bring classes. Uh, in terms of community outreach, I'm looking to do some family nights. So we'll have um, several nights this summer that are mostly <coughs> geared towards the students who are in Adventure Club and Mini Adventures, but then also um, have four family nights planned over the next year um, that will be a time for folks to come and bring their families and, and their kids out to do some kind of activity and explore the garden. Uh, we'll be doing a community ed class, probably a parent-child cooking class in the fall. Um, and this summer I'll be working with a group of high school students throughout the summer to um, develop them to be garden leaders and to expose them to other folks who are working in agriculture here in the Twin Cities so that they sort of have a sense of what it's like to maintain that kind of a space and to grow their own food and also what sort of potential careers um, and opportunities for volunteering and things like that there are in the field. So thank you all so much for your time, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I also just want to point out the really cool graphic mm -hmm. that the communications department worked with us on, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? I just want to say, um, you know, congratulations on a great project out there. Mm -hmm. You have touched so many um, students and adults um, in this community, and I think it's, it's always exciting to hear my kids. I think I said this last year, too, but... Um, 
all of us that have children, I think every one of them has been there in some mm -hmm. capacity. Um, and I, I love hearing about how you how you touch in the area, other areas of their learning with the garden. So um, kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great job blending it in with the rest of the curriculum so it makes sense to the kids. It's not just a field trip. It's an everyday thing that they're a part of, and I think that's great. Thank you. It's been really great to see the ways that the garden sort of reinforces things. I was just at um, Valley View last week planting, I planted transplants with all the fourth graders and they just did structures of life. So they were able to like give me ants, like all of this information about seeds and seed parts and all the things that were, that are kind of go into that. Um, so I emailed Shauna, the science specialist there and sort of said, your students know this really well. So I think it's a, I think it's a great way for students to get to see that they, the, the things they're learning in the classroom matter and explain the world. And it's really a beautiful thing how, um, how you had it designed over there. And it's actually a beautiful thing when it's in action <laughs> that you can touch all the, yes. all the different subjects with it and, like you said, make it real for them. And um, <clears throat> it's a very good way to answer the question of why do I have to learn this? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. We like to say that there isn't a subject that can't be enhanced with a garden and that it's the classroom with the most beautiful ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Except for last night. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. That was not fun. I beg to differ. Too soon. Too soon. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks. Nice job. It's Thank exciting. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up would be an update on the ship grant. <clears throat> Chair Larkin, members of the school board, Superintendent Kelly. I am pleased to be able to present this evening an update about the SHIP grant, the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership Grant. It used to be called Program, but they changed it to Partnership, which we have been able to participate in as Anoka County invited us to be a partner. This is our second year with the SHIP grant. The core values that this grant really embody our community collaboration and innovation. And I'd also like to just acknowledge the principals who are in the room this evening as they are really heading up this SHIP grant at their individual schools. Columbia Heights Public Schools has been invited to partner in two different ways with SHIP this time. So this is SHIP 4.0. You'll remember that SHIP 1.0 provided Blooming Heights SHIP 2.0 really delved into active classrooms, which you'll learn more about in one of the upcoming agenda items, and also really looking at improving the food that we serve and food service, and also some um, safe routes to school elements. Then Anoka County didn't participate in SHIP 3.0. We're happy that we're participating with SHIP 4.0 now. So if you see 4.0, that's where that comes from. So we've been invited um, to be both a school-based site, and this is located at each of our schools. That it's The work of that is done by the school-based wellness team or leadership team, and the initiatives are based on what each school's area of interest is. The other SHIP grant is the, um, the work site, and that is where we are a work site and we're able to support our staff in areas of wellness. First, I'll start with the school-based partnership. Um, this is, we are in year two with that, and some of the areas that we've worked on are active recess training, which we did before the school year started for our recess monitors in the three elementary schools. We've provided two sessions of yoga calm training for teachers and staff, and we've been able to reinforce that with opportunities for them to get together every other month to meet for an hour to talk about how they're implementing that in their classroom. We've provided physical education materials at North Park and Valley View. And tower gardens, which just arrived. This is a picture of what a tower garden is. They just arrived on Friday. And they are vertical opportunities for growing plants inside. And that is a collaboration also with our food service, where some of the food will be harvested off of that and served in our lunchroom in the salad bars. 
other areas, the playground stencil materials for Valley View, and that's a project coming up very soon that will come to completion and ribbon cutting on May 6th. Hydration stations have been installed at Columbia Academy, Valley View, North Park, and Highland. Uh, reinforcing that is the Rethink Your Drink curriculum. You'll see how many packets of sugar <laughs> are in that poster, and those, those are, that's an example of some of the posters hung around the hydration stations. We're going to provide an outdoor sink for the courtyard area at North Park so that students are able to wash their hands as they are doing um, work in the garden, and then recess materials for Highland. As a worksite partnership, there are three areas that we've focused on. One is supporting materials in each of the schools for um, parents who are um, needing to do pumping. And then we also created this moving heights bin for break rooms so that staff, when they have breaks, can um, do things that are like active school day for students. This would be for staff, and there's a picture of the bin on the right-hand side. And then also um, a bicycle for each of the schools so that when staff are going between the buildings instead of getting in their car and driving, they can jump on the bike and go between, um, between schools. We'd really like to take this opportunity to thank Anoka County for inviting us to partner. And here also a thank you to the Communications Department for the Moving Heights graphic uh, on, on this project. Thank you. Questions or comments? I really like that you included stuff for the staff. I mean, people mm -hmm. always work on stuff for the kids. And that's a wonderful thing, of course, that's what we're here to do, but it's easy to overlook the staff, the teachers and staff, so I'm, I appreciate that you did that. Thank you, and it's good role modeling also for the students. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Next up is the active school day. I believe we have a host of people headed to the table. Chair Larkin, members of the school board, Superintendent Kelly, uh, we're here this evening to prevent in, present information, provide an informational update on the active school day. So I'm here with all three of our elementary principals along with Director Kristen Stunkel. Of course, Columbia Heights Public Schools strives <clears throat> to create worlds of opportunity for every learner through our mission. And this presentation will focus on the core values of excellence and innovation, innovation in ways finding innovative ways to be active and move throughout the school day. So this is an informational update. There will be no governance questions. Um, but a question did come to us through the superintendent's office about what, what opportunities do elementary students have for movement and activity during the school day? Um, so we posted a survey and we're pleased to have 60 responses from our elementary teachers. <coughs> Um, we posed three questions. How often do you incorporate active brain breaks or brain boosts in your classroom? How often do you incorporate active seating in your classroom? And how often do you incorporate active transitions in your classroom so that students are up and out of their seats? <coughs> so the first response yielded that, um, that teachers are providing brain breaks or brain boosts um, in their classroom Every day, 68% of them are, and then multiple times per week, 20% of them. And then you can see 7% one to two times per month and 5% stated other. We gave them the opportunity to talk about what kinds of things they're doing and to share that. Um, we're gonna have Principal DeWitt share some of the activities that they do, and there's a few examples on the screen. I'll use this one. Um, probably the most popular of, of the list is for sure Go Noodle. Um, these are songs with dances that um, the kids really get into all the way from kindergarten or pre-K up through grade five. The students are up out of their chairs. They're um, singing and dancing and acting out the motions of many different Go Noodle songs. I've seen this in classrooms where the student, a student of the day gets to select what Go Noodle and they have their favorites. Um, 
Also, a significant amount of stretching that the teachers are adding in, just a simple stand up, stretch, um, do a few calisthenics. Um, often, these are tied to academic skills, so they, they might be um, spelling out words as they're doing a push-up on their chair. Um, at Highland, and I'm sure some of the other schools as well, but the, t the staff were ch um, trained in energizers, and they all have this um, book. And most of the activities in this book are related to curriculum, so it's how you activate the curriculum and different ideas. The other um, big skill that we're really starting to see now after more staff are trained is yoga calm. So with um, some mani manipulatives, but also just with the teachers inviting the students onto the carpet, uh, a key ki time for yoga calm is when the students are coming in from recess as a way to restart for afternoon learning. But it is a nice break in the morning if they have a long morning of reading and math where they will do, take a yoga break and do a couple activities where they may stretch or do some breathing activities and get up and move. So the second question that we asked teachers was, how often do you incorporate active seating into your classroom? Um, so this was about 50-50 of teachers having um, active seating or different types of seating in their classroom and other teachers still um, with, with tables and desks. Um, so for a variety of reasons. And so let's have Principal Fort share some examples of active seating. Could you give us a definition of active seating? Yeah. That. Oh, look at that. Pictures, cool. Yeah. <laughs> that works. <clears throat> yes. Uh, our heaviest uh, users of the active seating are our fifth grade. They are every, cla every classroom um, has, uh, they have tables of various heights, low, low level tables, medium levels, high levels. Um, and they have those uh, apparatus or apparati uh, there. They have the um, uh, uh, regular sized chairs. They have milk crates with pads on them. They have the balance balls. I don't know, I'd call them wo wobbly stools. There's probably a more official name for them, but they, you have to ba basically balance yourself. They use those stationary pedals uh, while seated at different levels. And these activities take place at um, usually during independent work time. Okay, so there's, there's still a, uh, um, a kind of a forum for whole group instruction when the kids are all on the carpet at one time. But those types of things are done when there's independent work time. They have, each classroom has a tent uh, in the classroom and it's, and it's to, to kind of promote a uh, comfortable, um, you know, an environment for, for the classroom uh, so the kids can, uh, they're not as uniform as they might be throughout the, the rest of the day. So, um, we, in addition to that, we have uh, isolated instances throughout the building, um, different classes, different grade levels, based on the needs of the children. Uh, we, uh, the kids have, uh, some, some of the kids have uh, sensory break times that are built into their daily schedule based on their, their needs. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it for the uh, active seating. But uh, it's a way. It's it's fun to see the kids a um, little kind of different in a different kind of environment. And it's mostly at, again mostly at fifth grade and isolated throughout the rest of the building. And depending on the needs of the children, the kid, the teachers are really good about uh, being able to read students and when they need breaks. As uh, Michelle was mentioning, all uh, all of our teachers. Uh, they have their own rubric for when the kids need uh, a break. We used to have, we have these things called jamming minutes as well that we started a couple years ago that were just ways of, uh, to get the kids up and moving after they've been seat, uh, uh, seated for a long time. Thank you. So, of course, all of the learning studios at North Park Elementary have a variety of the seating that you can see on the screen. Um, and then some of the classrooms at Highland and um, have opportunities for that. Many of this type of um, seating, uh, much of it was um, sought out via grant or a donation or you know different programs such as that. The third question for the teachers was, how often do you incorporate active transitions in your classroom so that students are up and moving out of their seats? So here you can see an overwhelming majority said daily, um, an additional 12% um, multiple times per week 
per week. Um, 3% saying never, and some of those, just in me reading some of them, they had the ability to put comments there. Um, some of those were, well, I'm doing a, I do a small pull-out reading group, and so kind of the transition from the classroom to the reading group, that's their transition, and otherwise we're, we're working for the 15 or 20 minutes, so it wasn't really appropriate for that answer. So, and then um, within, that, um, within that as well, there was an other comments about... Um, we have, I have specific transitions or activities for particular kids who demonstrate the need. So those were some of the others. Um, there are some other examples of active opportunities and Principal Sasek is gonna talk about those. We take full advantage of, of transitions and make them as positive a thing as possible because everyone knows that transitions can really be quite negative for kids um, if, if they're not done well. Um, so it's, it runs the gamut at North Park, for instance, from in the learning studios. I mean, students oftentimes are moving furniture during transitions um, you know, to, to support their learning um, into their next, uh, into their next uh, learning opportunity. Um, in kindergarten, I was just in a kindergarten class last week, and in, in the transition between a reading activity and a writing activity, uh, they were doing yoga. Um, they were uh, doing downward dog, and, you know, and, and just uh, doing stretches and, and breathing techniques and stuff um, just to keep them active. Uh, students are often encouraged uh, to move uh, outside of the classroom. Uh, for instance, I, I take a lot of walks. I'm an active learner myself, um, and I have a schedule um, that there are certain students I pick up at certain times during the day because they need a sensory break. Um, so many of our staff people uh, do sensory breaks for students throughout the day. Um, we also have uh, gym bags, um, and we have students who, who need more activity, and you can kind of tell, and you say, you know, hey, uh, you know, Jimmy, why don't you go take a, you know, Mrs. Sturm really needs this gym bag, you know, okay, <laughs> go bring that to her, it's really important, you know, and just, we'll get the kid out of the class, they'll have a little errand, a little job, it'll take a couple of minutes, but they get to move. Um, we have other jobs, like uh, our students uh, take care of our uh, healthy snack program, um, so our older students deliver the healthy snacks, and then um, the students within the classrooms have the job <coughs> of taking the snack bins down into uh, the cafeteria to uh, dispose uh, of the organics into the, or into the compost pile um, and, and to return them to the kitchen. So um, throughout the day, um, we're seeing students moving uh, every opportunity um, that we have. So... Yeah. Active movement isn't only a K-5 thing. We also have a lot of activity and movement happening in our early childhood classrooms, so Director Stunkel will talk about that. As many of you know, early childhood, um, they're always moving. <laughs> so uh, they are, they're moving throughout the classroom. It's, it's not at all a, a sitting in a desk kind of situation. But we do also have a big muscle room, is what we call it, um, one of the rooms here in the Family Center that ECS, Early Childhood Special Education, ECFE, Early Childhood Family Education, our Pre-K-3 program, and also our Mini Adventures makes use of. Through SHIP, as you just heard, our Statewide Health Improvement Partnership, many of the items that uh, you saw, those, the, um, the movable seating arrangements and, and some, the energizer training, the yoga calm, all was funded through SHIP mm. 2.0. And then also we partner with activities and athletics for opportunities. Students after school that are at the secondary level have the open gym time and they also have access to the weight room and summer programming. And then we also, a couple of years ago, as you might remember, added an additional 15 minutes for that lunch and recess period in order to give um, students the opportunity for more movement. One new opportunity that um, the third grade teachers at Valley View have um, requested and wrote a little mini grant to get were, were these UNICEF kid power bands. And so all the third graders at Valley View run around with these little um, power bands and as they accumulate steps, um, it goes to benefit the UNICEF. And so kids are really, it's a learning, as, as Superintendent Kathy Kelly says, see, do, and learn, right? So they're really moving and they can see the, that it's counting and it doesn't only count for their own health, but it counts for other children across the world as well. So they're very excited about that. Um, so what are our next steps after we've gathered this data, right? So as you could see, um, there's a lot of active <coughs> transitions. Um, there's some um, teachers had some questions about opportunities for active seating and then um, also more opportunities for professional development around such things as the energizers or any of the other opportunities. So we are looking at um, 
what professional development opportunities we'll be offering in this area next school year. Um, we are also planning on providing a list of the available resources for all of our staff um, so they know what that is and how to obtain it themselves. And then um, we're in the process of seeking additional resources as well in this area. Questions and or comments? I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, with the survey, was that done just in the <coughs> elementary schools or was that kind of surveyed at each of the schools? The results here were primarily elementary. Okay. Or all of the results showed today were element, were K-5. Mm -hmm. I guess I would also be interested in seeing if there is a possibility of seeing what that breakdown per school is. Um, and part of that, I think I'm wondering if the North Park answers might skew some of those results because obviously with learning studios those are far more active classrooms than some of our traditional classrooms so i'd be interested at least seeing those numbers pulled out um, and then looking at more of the traditional classrooms as well anyone else Totally explains why I carried a phone book around a lot in elementary school. <laughs> it was a really one of the really big It was big like ones. a yellow pages, yeah. Okay. Had to deliver it to the office many times. <laughs> There's only one in the whole school. Teachers needed to share it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You too, Nanny. Thanks, Thanks for sharing. Uh, <laughs> Nobody else has any other questions. Is everybody staying for the next one too? All right, well let's move on to the power of yet growth mindset. Chair Larkin, school board members, Superintendent Kathy Kelly, um, we are here this evening to provide an up informational update on um, what we do in Columbia Heights Public Schools around the concepts of growth mindset and the power <coughs> of yet. So of course, Columbia Heights provides worlds of opportunity for every learner. And this presentation will focus on the core values of excellence and courage. I think about that courage it takes to make a mistake and learn from the mistake and continue to persist through it with that growth mindset. So again, this is an informational update. It's not a governance issue. Um, the question was brought forth asking how growth mindset and the power of yet are incorporated into Columbia Heights Public Schools. <clears throat> so across the district, um, there are a variety of ways that district-led professional development or meetings or activities um, involve mindset work. So the teaching and learning leadership is a group of, that represent um, all five schools in the district, administration teachers, represent, teacher representatives, along with early childhood, um, come together uh, about six times a year for professional development with the area focusing on um, college and career readiness and equity in our district. So these are kind of the, the lead group that then takes it back. So both last year and then again this year, we did work around the around growth mindset. Um, so last year, really honing in on the original um, text from Carol Dweck, and then this year um, <clears throat> presented some additional articles and writings and findings from the author Carol Dweck um, to kind of as she's building upon her concepts. Um, all of the schools in the district, all of the K-12 K schools in the district use AVID, and AVID heavily relies on Carol Dweck's work around growth mindset, and so that's always a part of the professional development. Um, also within respon the Responsive Classroom Leadership Committee, um, they've done some work around growth mindset, and so for example, when the elementary schools have a book of the month, and we're aligning them to, to the different life skills, including persistence, um, we talk about the growth mindset there and how to talk to um, children about it when we're using that. This year, the K-12 math teachers are reading a book called Mathematical Mindsets, and so it's taking the concepts of growth <coughs> mindset and applying it to math. And then of course, in our most recent college and career guides for parents, which would be the elementary and the, and the um, early childhood, um, Director Mayhem received permission from the author of a, gra a mindset graphic, which you'll see coming up. So we're gonna, eat, we're gonna talk a little bit about each of the programs <clears throat> and schools and touch on some of the specific mindset work that's happening around the district. So with early childhood. Excuse me, sorry. On our 
Family Center website under Parent Resources. Um, parents are able to access an online copy of this college and career guide, but we also give out, we distribute to all of our ECFE pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 families this document that includes the graphic that you see on the right-hand side, which shows the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. So really, that reminder to parents that intelligence can be developed and that through effort and persistence, not only students but also adults can gain skills and knowledge. And so the importance of um, praising effort and really focusing on um, challenge, facing challenges without fear. And I have a couple of quotes from our early childhood teachers um, in giving ways of, or examples of how they use the growth mindset in their classroom. This one teacher says that she shares with my, I share with my students when we begin writing our names or drawing a self-portrait in September that this may be hard and that is okay. Rather than saying I can't, instead we say things like I will try. We talk about um, that as we practice things, they become easier and easier and pretty soon things that used to be hard for us um, are no longer as difficult. So really planting that seed in early childhood. And then another example was in learning some of the self-help skills. An example is struggling with putting on all of their gear, their jackets, hats, and mittens um, when they go outside because we do take them outside um, regularly. We practice the words that you use and techniques that you can apply that will make the tasks easier and eventually the students will be more self-efficient um, self-sufficient in completing the task. So, and then there's also um, an opportunity for students to see um, on their cubbies how to, where to place their things and, and recognizing their names. So throughout the classroom, there are reinforcements for the students. So next we'll hear from Principal DeWitt at Highland about the work that they've done around the power of the end. All right, so we've um, taken growth mindset um, pretty seriously at Highland over the past couple of years. Um, this year's fall PD in August really surrounded around um, starting with a video, really inspiring video to get students or to get teachers thinking about how to engage learners in putting yet in a, in a negative sentence. So I'm not a good reader yet. Um, and really looking at what are the, how are the, what is the process or what are the steps to get to um, the skills that students want to have. So um, <coughs> this was a TED talk that we watched. It was really powerful, 11 minutes, so we're not going to show it to you today. But um, very engaging for the staff, lots of um, excellent question and discussion afterward. Um, when we finished the video, the next step of the PD was giving teachers time to prepare visuals for their classroom. So it was being inspired, really, the video was the, was the jumping off point, but then really taking the information from the PD and the video into um, <coughs> video or visuals that could enhance not only the hallways, but also the classrooms. Most of the, I think most of the board members have seen the large murals um, over at Highland in the stairwell that comes toward the district office. So that was created by our art teacher, Joy Belicious, to really highlight um, the inspiration of the power of yet over both sides of the, of the mural. So you'll see that work up here. Also enhanced, um, there are a couple small posters that we have that really go along with the mural that have statements about yet statements. All right, so let's move to North Park with Principal Sasek. Um, we also take uh, mindset work very seriously at North Park and have for several years. Um, our entire staff uh, read Dweck's work uh, this year. Our leadership team read it uh, three years ago, and uh, we figured that it was a really good opportunity uh, to uh, have the entire staff to read it. And, and really, our focus very much has been on, on adult mindset also, because I think sometimes you can kind of forget about that. You work so hard on your student mindset. Um, it's really important that our adults 
also have a growth mindset. Um, and so really we've worked on language an awful lot. And you'll find these charts in every classroom and learning studio at North Park. Um, it, it'll show negative statements and it'll show positive substitutions. Um, positive su substitutions that students can use um, to, to show that, they're ha that they have a growth mindset. Um, for instance, mistakes help me learn. Uh, failure is something that we have Preaching the gospel of North Park, we embrace failure very much. Um, failure is an essential part of learning. Um, and that's something that we've been talking about for several years. And this really, that, that concept fits really well um, with Dweck's work in mindsets. And, um, and so again, we've challenged our teachers this year um, to show the same growth mindsets that we're expecting out of our students. And they've done a wonderful job. We've dedicated 30 minutes to every staff meeting um, uh, working on growth mindset. Um, and it's really been a wonderful year of learning uh, for our adults as, as well as our students. <clears throat> all right, we're also working on mindset at Valley View, so Principal Fort. Okay, as I think was Zena mentioned about the uh, responsive classroom and AVID, um, part of what we try to do is to uh, align and connect lots of the programs that we do. So RC, AVID, uh, we try to do uh, life skills, um, and with the um, the RC program, we have hopes and dreams, and that's uh, just about every classroom, probably in all the buildings, but that's something that's done for RC in the very beginning of the year. And we have the kids do it, and the, uh, the adults do it as well. And uh, some, some, some of what we encourage is the going to college and attending college. And we try to plant that seed at an early age with uh, some of our students. You know, some have more, maybe more immediate goals that they set. Um, you know, academic goals or what have you, but, um, you know, that's uh, uh, the other thing that we have done is the, um, the AVID program. We took the acronym WICOR, uh, W-I-C-O-R, and it stands for Writing, Inquiry, uh, Collaboration, Organization, and Reading, and we divided up the year, of course, into quarters, and, and said we were going to focus on different aspects of that uh, program, uh, quarterly to make sure that we uh, had a comprehensive coverage um, at all grade levels. And that's basically, that's a, uh, another kind of a strategy that we did. Um, the uh, equity part of it, I think uh, as Jeff mentioned about the adults as well, we have a strong equity team at Valley View, have for several years, with us. Uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, they read the book Mindsets uh, as well. It's a study group, there's an equity group and then there's a study group a lot of the same people are on both. It's kind of a core of our, uh, kind of our school equity um, program. They have read uh, Racing to Class. Uh, Richard Milner, who was here a year or two ago, mm -hmm. came to the district and presented as well as to our school. Uh, Tanahashi Coates, um, they've read, they're currently reading that book. Teaching for Equity uh, by Linda Crawford and Chip Wood, they have read that. And again, what they are, they're currently decided to, uh, they have their own individual projects and goals. And so they're doing some reading of articles themselves and they bring th these articles to the, to the study group and, and, and they help lead a discussion about the article. They all read it and then they help read, uh, um, uh, facilitate a discussion about those articles. So, um, and then I, I guess a major project for us this year was IDI, Intercultural Developmental Inventory. Uh, was done uh, voluntarily at the uh, beginning of the, the year. Uh, and um, we um, took from it, you get a, a school uh, assessment, and then you also have the opportunity, confidential uh, personal uh, assessments of each, each person that took it. And um, it's, the attempt is to build inter intercultural competence uh, in our staff members uh, as well. So. Those are some of the things that we have done at um, Valley View. So mindset isn't only an um, early childhood through fifth grade topic. Of course, Columbia Academy and the high school also focus on mindset. We do across the district. Um, so just some visuals Columbia, from Columbia Academy, of course, is there in their second year of AVID. It's been a permeation throughout the, throughout the building. Um, so just a few uh, snapshots from different classrooms for you. Um, 
And then I wanted to include this photo from the high school because recently I was um, at a discussion with members of multiple other districts and the pep fest topic came up at the table and I guess I really didn't know that other high schools don't include academics and arts in their pep fest celebrations that that they really do just like a football pep fest well if you've ever been to one of our pep fests at the high school um, it's permeates and it's kind of the, the end result of mindset right and so we're about academics we're about college and career readiness and we can and if we're not there we'll get, yet we'll get there um, so recently we had a we had a pep fest and again not just athletes are recognized, but also our scholars and our artists and our, our other students are, are recognized at the pep fest as well. So um, really exciting work. Questions? I do have a question. Um, I appreciate that the pro professional development has been offered to all of the teachers at the elementary schools especially, um, because I think that's probably where most of the work goes um, in terms of the power yet. But is was it attended by all of the teachers and incorporated into all of the classrooms, or was this kind of an optional, whether, I know that some teachers do things better than others, or um, how, how many classrooms is it in most, or can you speak on that? Yeah, Thank at you. Highland it was all licensed teachers. It was um, required because it was during workshop week, so it was a required building and service time, not a choice where they would sign up for different options. Um, having visuals in the classroom is also required. So there's something in every class. You could go around it and find it in any room. Um, we do a district, I, I had it on my list, but um, didn't get to it. We do a district wide or a building wide saying. So every morning, if you've been in Highland, when school starts, the end of the morning announcements is always, I say, if we believe, and then everyone in the school parrots back, we can achieve. And so that, from the beginning of the school year, very first day of school, the students learned it and talked about what does that motto mean. And so that's been a very consistent effort of teaching pre-K through five about feeling good about what you can do and how you move forward from that. We just had a uh, um, consultant on Friday that uh, helped us with the intercultural uh, inventory uh, developmental inventory, and it was uh, it was so it, it's been a process that we started at the beginning of the year, um, and we're still continuing to you, to to um, focus on it. Um, all of our staff are there, and in, in in addition, equity is in our rotation of meetings that we have on a, on a regular basis, probably once every five weeks, and all staff uh, attend those meetings. And at North Park, every licensed person has been required to read Mindset, uh, and it's been uh, um, voluntary f and for our non-licensed staff, and many of those uh, staff people have read it also and choose to attend um, our staff meetings on their own time. And so every staff meeting, we have at least 30 minutes of Mindset work, and every single classroom at North Park, uh, you'll find many of the same visuals uh, available. So it's, it's pretty equitable throughout the building. Wonderful. Um, so I was wondering when you observe the teachers or other observers in the district do, do you also look, do you actively look for evidence to see that the students are there and learning mindset or that it's being implemented in the classes consistently? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And language, I think all three of us, lang language and growth uh, mindset language are things that we look very closely for. Anyone else? Great. It'll be fun to see how that spills out into their adulthood and into the way they live their lives. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Have a good night. Uh, next up, Director Holmgren is going to talk to us about opportunity for a solar array. Yeah. Chair Lockham, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Kelly. Um, I guess first I just um, want to, I know we have some new board members that maybe don't know that we actually have a solar array on one of our roofs over at Columbia Academy. Um, and 
the, the, the solar, the solar for Minnesota schools, um, this, this is something that's been going on actually for quite a, quite a few years. And every year we put schools into a, into a lottery. And uh, four years ago, um, we won that lottery with uh, Columbia Academy uh, being picked, and there is a solar array on that roof. Now this year, we've continued to put our schools in every year. This year, we actually had two schools picked. So I'm just gonna kinda give you an update on, on that, and then um, uh, if the board is interested in going forward and putting those arrays on, we'll certainly move forward with the uh, paperwork to get that taken care of. So again, we are here to create um, worlds of opportunities for every learner um, here at Columbia Heights Public Schools. Um, and when we look at our, our core values, we're really looking at, when we look at this project, we're looking at community collaboration and innovation. Um, it's, it's really co a collaboration between the state of Minnesota, um, utility companies, in our case is Excel Energy, um, Ideal Energies, they're the, they're the company um, who puts this project together, and of course the school district. The nice thing about this, there is absolutely no cost to the school district whatsoever. Um, over a 25-year period, that they look at the life of this array, about 25 years, really a savings of that time of $444,000, um, which is about a $17,000 savings uh, for the school district on a yearly basis. Of course, it starts a lot smaller and it builds as we go forward because it assumes that our energy cost in the future is going to be higher than it is now. Um, the, the array... Um, is a, is a 40 kW array. You can see that, because we live in Minnesota, when we look at uh, you know, November, December, January, because of the angle of the sun, we get a little less um, energy generated, but the rest of the year, the array does a pretty good job. Um, here's an example of, of what they look like on the roof. Um, it's interesting, they've um, really changed the angle of of how those um, go up in the roof now compared to where we started here four years ago. These are um, quite a bit flatter to try to get more sun. And this might be a little hard to read. Uh, but the way, the, the way this works is the first 12 years of this project, the majority of the savings goes back to Ideal Energies to actually pay for the array. So we get about a 20, we get about 25% of it, and 75% of that savings goes to them until it's paid for. It takes 12 years to do that. And then at that point, then we get 100% of the savings, and it's our rate to keep forever, and we never had to pay a dime to get it. So it's, it's, it's not a huge savings, but it gives us a possibility to save some dollars, and of course it's a green thing to do as a public entity. So you get an idea when you look at the graph, this is really kind of what it looks like. At the front end, we're not saving a lot, but uh, going forward into the future, there's, there's quite a bit savings. And let's say we talked about, about 444,000 over the life of that uh, particular ray on, us, on our roof. So um, that's kind of the short, the short version. Um, I just, my, um, the reason I brought it forward to today is of course we were picked and we have to decide whether we're gonna go ahead with the array. So I, um, I will bring it to the board at our next meeting to take action on whether you wanna um, go into that um, arrangement with Ideal Energies. And I guess I'm just, I'm open to questions. Um, yes, um, I have I have a question because I know we're we're kind of maybe looking at um, doing some improvements over at North Park, since North Park is one of the schools that was selected. Um, how would that work with um, any of the plans that we have over there? Okay, uh, first of all, the you know footprint of the building over there, you know the roofs that are there are still going to be there. We're, we're not taking any part of the building off. So the area that this, um, where we're looking at putting this is actually over the top of the gymnasium. That's our highest part of the building. Um, and then, even though we might use the space below in the gym area differently, the roof is still going to be where it is. Um, we've, we've also included, because we did the same thing when we looked at Columbia Academy, you know, if there's an issue sometime where we need to replace that roof, um, it's built in that they have the cost of coming in and moving it. And what they do, they really don't take it apart. We lift it up a little bit, we put wheels under it, and we just roll it over, and we're done with the roof, we just roll it back. So it's actually a relatively simple way to uh, move it out of the way while we need to do any roofing costs, you know, or roofing projects that we need to do. So it doesn't do any damage to the roof itself? It's there, Bill, if I could, I just was looking at the ones that the, the city did at the, the 
public safety building and they've done it at two of the different liquor stores. Those aren't mounted to the building. Okay. It's they're all you see the blocks. The, the pads or blocks or yeah. Yeah, they're weighted and they yeah. it's it's engineered to where they put blocks where they feel like they need them and everything else. The only thing that maybe is secure to the building would be the wires that they're running, the cable to get yeah. to to get the power and to work. The roof is, I mean, obviously rated to hold the extra weight. Yes. That's, okay. This is actually really isn't very heavy at all. Okay. And then in terms of like if they get damaged in weather, is that on our insurance tab or is that, how's that? At the first part, the first 12 years, no. Okay. But after, yes. Okay. Um, of course, so we have insurance for that. So okay. if something, if we had some type of storm come through, that would be included in our storm damage, okay. the insurance we have for on our buildings. We asked a lot of those questions yeah. too when we were looking at them, and I think the the weighting is for gale force winds or whatever. So I mean, their expectation I of like it a coming hail up. Size yeah, too. I mean, for breaking them, yep. I mean, even though the resistance to the hail and the impact and stuff is pretty high, it can happen. But um, the the way that my understanding of the way they're designed, they would you would think theoretically they would have that in mind. In Minnesota, yeah, they so. they take the the weather conditions of where they're putting them up into consideration. So. So the insurance for insuring them for the first 12 years, I'm assuming it's not a significant expense. I know it's not. No, um, you know, when we look at, you know, we really have a big, you know, total package um, when we look at the um, any type of an insurance product for our buildings and adding the small piece, it won't even affect our insurance rates. Okay. They'll just be added as, a, as another um, asset that we have. Right. I just had one other question. Um, in terms of maintenance, does it take time from any of our employees to, to do anything regularly, or should anything happen? They're actually, they're actually maintenance-free. Nothing moves okay. on, on this array. We, they put it up. It sits there. Um, of course, if we have breakage, that's one thing, but you know, it just sits there and, and, and collects sunlight. The, the wires you know, move all the, all the electricity. There's nothing, nothing that moves. Does snow accumulate on them and need to be brushed off or like satellite dishes, that type of thing? We really haven't. The one we have, we've never had to brush off. Usually if we get a, if we get a big snow, um, when the sun comes back out, because they, they absorb so much light that it melts right off. Okay. Lord, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I remember when we, um, when we put them over at the academy that we had to do some safety improvements on the roof. Would that be an issue with either one of the buildings where we'd be looking at additional expense? I'm not sure there was any safety. Um, the railing. Oh, the railings that we put up, that was, that was an OSHA project, and that actually went on every building. So it wasn't just Columbia okay. Academy. Okay. It was all of our buildings all that we did buildings. that project okay. too. I, I just remember that little expense. I was like, oh, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, have, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding, I think it was Natty's question with the insurance um, and damages. So I'm assuming that any upkeep, damage issues, breakage during the first 12 years would not be our responsibility, but then afterwards it, it yes. would be? Yes, okay. yes it is. And, and then you said these have about a 25 year lifespan? Yeah, and of course, these ones that we've started putting up here the last five years, you know, don't, you know, we really don't have an experience to 25 years, so we don't know that. I mean, they could easily last longer, but at this point, they've put a 25-year life on them. And so as far as the, the utility savings that, that go through, you had said that essentially we, we will realize about 25% of the savings because the other 75% will go to pay for, for the equipment for the project um, for those first 12 years. Correct. correct? Who calculates those savings? So how is that, how is that calculated? Well, there's a meter on the roof that, right. that keeps track of the, of the power. Okay. And really, all it, it actually changes once they get it paid for. Um, so as that electricity comes, we get these credits on our bill, and 75% and um, goes over to Ideal Energy. You know, when that's paid off, we're actually we're done. So if for some reason we would um, collect extra, which, you know, they, they really look at what, because of our those low months that we have in December and January and February. You know, I, I don't think we'll get extra, but, you know, actually, I mean, once we get it, once we put it up, I can actually show you a, a website you can go to and actually see the actual, the actual power that we're generating on a daily basis. I'm sorry, I'm still not quite understanding. So when we when we have these savings, right? So you said that there's a meter and it'll show the electricity that these are generating and there will be a, like a credit on our Excel energy mm -hmm. bill for that. So then will we like write a check to 
this company for I, their this percentage. actually works nice because of, because of the partnership through Excel Energy. Excel Energy actually sends the money okay. to them. Okay. We don't have to send a check. So essentially, I, I think what I'm getting at too is I just want to make sure too that this is being audited by some third party. So it's not essentially this company saying this is how much money that you owe us or that we're going to take, but that there's some sort of auditing that's in place to make sure that those numbers are legitimate. Yeah, it's is it's Excel actually okay. reading the actual meter on okay. the on the array itself. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? You be bringing this back on the twenty fourth. Is that correct? Yeah. As an action item. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Speaking of action items, um, first up would be the health insurance bids. Yes, I came to you. Um, Seems like a long time. We didn't have very many meetings in, in March, but um, we had an, our, our bid opening um, and we went through quite, you know, some detail of the rates. Um, the way this bidding process works, the, all these companies need to have an opportunity to come back a second time to give us their best and final offer. Um, when that happened, you can see on page 57 of your handout, we actually had some lower rates. You can see now that... Uh, the South Central Service Cooperative, uh, which is uh, who we purchase our insurance through right now, actually only has a 1.5% increase in that first year. You see that Blue Cross Direct and Health Partners are, are trying to buy our, our, uh, serve, our uh, um, business. You can see some small negative amounts in the first year. But they really inkle to what they see the second year at. So we, they really make up for what they give up the first year. Um, our insurance committee really likes the insurance product that we have. They really uh, don't see enough change here to be um, changing. They really want to stay without any interruptions uh, for the, uh, you know, all the members of our, of our workforce. Um, and when you look at the actual percentages, I mean, the South Service Cooperative is the lowest. I mean, we don't have a guarantee in that second year, but they've been a, doing a very good job for us keeping our rates down. Um, and we've only had a 4% increase. When you really look at, you know, um, most insurance, when you look at across the board, really runs at a trend level of about 9%. So we're very happy with how the service cooperative has been working with us over the last um, quite a few years, probably, you know, 10 year period. We really haven't had very many increases. So the insurance company, insurance um, committee, uh, really brings forth forward tonight as their recommendation is to stay with the, the South Central Service Cooperative. Uh, is there any questions? Okay. Uh, looking for a motion to move that forward. So moved. Holla. Second. All right. Thank you. Discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstain. Motion thank carries. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Next up is a resolution discontinuing and reducing educational programs and positions. Good evening, Chair Larkins, Superintendent Kelly, members of the school board. Back in January of this school year, the school board directed the administration to make recommendations for reductions in programs and positions. That said, I'm here tonight asking the board to adopt a resolution to terminate, eliminate, and reduce certain positions for the 2017-2018 school year. This resolution is specifically related to unrequested leaves of absence. The position is listed within the resolution document in front of you. Okay, so we'll start with the motion a second, then I'll read the resolution. The so moved. Floor. Second. Andy, thank you. And the resolution reads, whereas the School Board of Independent School District 13, number 13 adopted a resolution on January 24th, 2017, directing the administration to make recommendations for reductions in programs and positions, and whereas said recommendations have been received and considered by the school board, be resolved by the School Board of Independent School District number 13 as follows. The following programs and positions be discontinued due to enrollment program elimination, curricular changes and departmental efficiencies. One FTE assistant principal, Columbia Academy. Um, so I had the motion by Laura, seconded by Molly. Maddie. Maddie, sorry, yep, I wrote it down right. I just said it wrong, thank you. Um, 
Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, Addy, if you would, do a roll call, please. Mueller? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Larkin? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Severson? Aye. A samurai? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Next up, uh, resolution proposing to place tenured administrator on unrequested leave of absence. Again, back in January, the school board adopted a resolution to reduce expenditures as necessary. Therefore, I'm asking the board to adopt a resolution proposing, proposing to place a tenured assistant principal whose name is listed within the resolution document on unrequested leave of absence. Again, looking for a motion. So moved. Paula? Second. Is that Lorian? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This resolution reads, whereas the school district's reductions in expenditures and school finances must include discontinuance of positions and discontinuance of curtailment of programs, whereas the School Board of Independent School District Number 13, Columbia Heights, directed the superintendent of schools and administration to consider the discontinuance of programs or positions to effectuate economies in the school district and reduce expenditures, make recommendations to the school board for discontinuance of programs, curtailment of programs, discontinuance of positions or curtailment of positions in order to balance the school district budget. Be it resolved by the school board of independent school district number 13 as follows, that it is proposed that the person stated in the resolution, uh, the assistant principal of said school district be placed on requested leave of absence without pay or of fringe benefits effective at the end of the 2016-2017 school year, no later than June 30th, 2017, pursuant to MS.122A.40, subdivision seven, and article 10, section one of the current master agreement between independent school district number 13 and the Columbia Heights principals. That said proposed placement on unrequested leave of absence as a result of discontinuance of positions, lack of pupil, pupils or financial limitations, and it is not the result of the implementation of an educa education district agreement. That written notice be sent to said assistant principal regarding proposed placement on unrequested leave of absence without pay or fringe benefits as provided by law and shall be in, substan shall be in substantially the form as on the notice below that each and all of the foregoing grounds of said notice are within the grounds of unre for unrequested leave placement as set forth by Minnesota Statute 122A.40, Subdivision 7, and Article 10, Section 1 of the current master agreement between Independent School District Number 13 are hereby adopted as fully as those separately set forth and resolved. Here. Okay. Discussion. Hearing none, and if you would, roll call, please. Mueller? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Larkin? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Severson? Aye. A samurai? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. Next up is the designation of electronic transfer designees. Bill? I, um, I'm bringing forward again uh, this again to you tonight. We have had another change in our accounting office over the last few weeks. Um, so I need an authorization for a new employee to be able to initiate electronic transfers. Um, a new employee we have in our business office, her name is uh, Denise Sundstrom. And I'm asking you tonight to give her uh, authority to do that. Start with a motion to move that forward. So moved. Laura? Second. Molly. Discussion. Question. Mm -hmm. could, could you remind me again of the, of the process to request the transfers? What, what we do is we have two people authorized to do the transfers, mainly because if, if someone's gone or someone leaves, someone can still take care of that. But as there's two of us there, um, Denise would initiate the transfers. I sign off um, authority for them to do that. So there's always two people looking at anything that happens electronically, and our banks also understand that. So as she initiates uh, a transfer, I get a call back um, from the particular bank um, to okay that transfer to go forward. That's what I wanted to make sure that there was the dual. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Have a good night. Board topics. Anyone have anything for board topics tonight? 
All right. Hearing none, we will adjourn the meeting at 8.31.